And we are live. Greetings, family. Welcome, welcome. We are here for another JMMB Goal Getter Live webinar. We haven't done a Thursday webinar for quite some time, but this is a special week because there is so much great information and content to share. We just had to do a Tuesday and a Thursday just for this week, but certainly for the rest of the month of July, we're just going to go back to Tuesday alone. It's it's kind of difficult to do a Tuesday, Thursday. Sometimes that is what we have to give people is a plan. But hey, we are here for you and we're happy to be here. And we're going to be continuing the conversation tonight about your goal of home acquisition. Look at all my MVPs coming up in the comments early. Richardo from YouTube. What's happening? What's happening? Glad to see you and the JMB family. Glad to see you too, Richardo. Hey, Shanique. Yes, we're ready again. Drop us a comment, guys. Drop us a comment from wherever you're watching from. We're streaming live on Facebook, YouTube and on Twitter via ter Periscope. And so we invite you to drop a comment. Tell us where you're watching us from. We're happy to have you and look forward to another great conversation tonight. So here's the deal, guys. As you know, on Tuesday, we had an awesome, awesome session, an awesome discussion. Hey, David, ready, ready, live and ready. Glad to have you. Hey, Jennifer, welcome. We had an awesome discussion on Tuesday, guys. And if you never saw the live, that's okay. If you saw the replay, we love you too. And if you don't see the replay yet, we love you even more because guess what? You've got to go catch that replay. It was our longest JMMB live webinar yet in terms of the length of time that it took. We are on for just over two hours. But let me tell you, it was chocked full of information because we started out the home acquisition conversation by talking about the 10 things they don't tell you about buying your own home, property, home, second home, first home, investment home, vacay home. And we had an attorney on, right, Stuart Stimson, and he gave some awesome, awesome nuggets and information, again, about the things that you may not even know about and things that you need to think about and do when you're in the process of acquiring a home or a property. So you have to catch that replay. It's like two hours of getting legal advice free of charge. Trust me, it was awesome, awesome. So go check it out. And tonight we're gonna to be continuing the home acquisition conversation. And tonight now we're looking at the other side of the coin because we had the attorney, we had your attorney on on Tuesday, kind of put yourself in the shoes. Tonight we're gonna to have a, your realtor on and a mortgage provider, JMB talking about the other side of the conversation about the things you need to do to be ready to apply for your mortgage and also to go through the search for the property as well as just really sealing that deal. So guys, we are here for some more awesome discussion. I love it. Hey, Radhika, Dina, uh, Rush Creative Weddings. I love it. Good night. What's happening, Kim? Kimiko? What's happening, Kimiko? Jennifer, Sharon, a velo, a, a velo. Let me tell you, don't knock me when I mispronounce these names, you know, guys. I see people coming on, so I'm giving you a lecture trying to come on. Andrew, Cherie, what's happening? Welcome, welcome. Yeah, man, Tuesday was packed with information. So tonight is going to be just as awesome. And we have two fabulous gentlemen here tonight, right, who are going to take us through the discussion. So here we go. I'm going to introduce them one by one so one person one of our guests is not a member of the jmmb team but hey we consider him family as well he is a realtor in his own right well respected and he is howard johnson jr we're gonna bring him up now hey hey howard how are you doing i'm good in the career i'm part of the family you know that's my bank <laughs> oh awesome great great the thing is i don't like to this I don't like to disclose who is client. I That's let them right. disclose. <laughs> I, I, I am proud to say I'm a proud member of the JMB family. Awesome. And we're happy yeah. to have you. The fact that you're here tonight makes your family and everybody who Thank is you. watching, you know your family, whether you're a client, team member, or you're just a part of this discussion. Hey, we're all family. So thanks for joining us, Howard. We appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thanks for having me. Great. And then now our next guest, he is a member of the JMB team specifically. He is one of our managers of client partnership, client partnership, client services, in fact, with JMMB Bank. And you may have seen him before. He was a guest on a previous live we would have done when we were at the time we were talking about how to manage your debt in the time of the COVID crisis. And he's here tonight to talk about how are we going to 
navigate this goal of acquiring our, your own home. And he is Jerome Jarrett. Hey, Jerome. I am good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Happy Welcome. to be here again. Absolutely. Happy to have you, Jerome. Thanks so much again for being here. We really appreciate it. Great. So we are going to get started. We want to again continue to big up everybody who's joining us on this live. Hey, Lorraine, what's happening? Good to see you. Jennifer, Jennifer is saying hello again. Devon, love to see you guys. Yes, guys, again, drop us a comment. Tell us where you're watching from. Let us know, you know, how is your journey going? Anybody here looking to acquire a home or property? Drop a comment. Let us know. And let's get into this discussion all right all right so COVID-19 or not folks still want to acquire a home or property right gents I mean that's just the way it is unfortunately for a number of us those plans would have had a spoke in the wheel been put in them because unfortunately some of us were negatively impacted by the economic and financial fallout that COVID would have caused but we're now in a stage of back to work and the reopening of the economy has already begun and uh, folks are still about all about getting back on track with achieving their goals, including the acquisition of a home. So we are here tonight to cover the key things that you need to know in that process. So I'm going to start out with Jerome, right? And of course, the first order of business when most people are looking to buy a home, a lot of us don't got the cash, all the cash to buy a property cash. Can I get an amen? I know I don't. I didn't. Um, usually we have to talk about a mortgage, right? And one of the first things that needs to occur and, and that mortgage providers like JMB would do initially is to check your credit report. If you're applying for a mortgage, they're going to be looking at your credit report, guys. And we would have brushed on this fact briefly on Tuesday, but now that we have Jerome here, could you tell us, Jerome, why is it important to know your credit score before applying for a mortgage? Well, um, again, good night, Kerry. Um, good night, Howard. Good night, everyone. Uh, it, it, it's very important for you to understand your credit before applying for a mortgage. For one, you know, you don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to be, you know, having discussion, engaging a realtor, engaging a vendor for a property and you can't afford the property when you can't access a mortgage, so you're not able to finance the purchase. So it's very important for the bank from a, from a, from a you know, just a know your customer standpoint to ensure that you, you are qualified. Um, it saves time, it saves your time, it saves the bank's time, it saves time on the realtor, and it also saves you money as well because you wouldn't be putting down a deposit on a property that you cannot afford because you run the risk of losing your deposit if you are unable to secure the mortgage. So it's very, very important that you know your credit. Um, if you knowingly have any facilities outside that you are not servicing to the best of your abilities, best you, 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 you know, bring those facilities up to date because if it is that you don't bring those facilities current and you have bad debts outside, you will not be able to secure a mortgage. So knowing your credit and understanding your credit is very, very, very important in the early stages. Thanks, Jerome. And just real quick, how do I find out my credit score? Is there a place, a number, a call, or is that something the mortgage provider would help me with? All right. So in Jamaica, we, we, we are not there yet where we use a credit score to qualify you. Um, we, we currently have two credit bureaus in Jamaica, um, Credit Info and Criffinem, where we, we look at how you service your debt. So we are we, we don't have that robust credit system like in, 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 in first world countries. But what we do have um, is that we look at how you manage your debt. Um, we look at your levels of delinquency. We look at the amount of debt you have. We look at how well you pay your debts. But we are not there where we use a credit score to qualify you for, um, for a mortgage. Not yet. Thank you so much. And I like to use some of these popular terminologies because I think in Jamaica, because a lot of us like the HGTV fans and yeah. so on, we hear these terminologies and we assume that they exist in Jamaica. Yeah. And, not, you yet, know, not yet, not yet, not, not yet. yet. We're, we're yet. getting there though, we're getting there. Good stuff, good stuff. So thanks for that clarification. So very important that even during this COVID time, I know we raised a point on Tuesday and I'm glad you, you underscored it, Jerome, that we want to encourage everybody to remember that if you have not been paying attention to your debt during this COVID time, even for circumstances beyond your control, some persons would have lost jobs, some persons would have wanted to defer debt, that would have had a negative impact on your, ability, on your credit report 
And so you would want to make sure to clean that up and allow some time to pass before you start venturing to assume big debt like a mortgage application and so I would have said, would have said in previous discussion that it's very important that you stay in contact with your banker, um, that your banker understands your finances. They are opportunities that are available to you in terms of moratoriums, in terms of um, different discussions you can have with your bank to you know defer payments, to defer interest, you know, defer principal payments. So have the conversation with your bank. Don't allow your credit to to be ruined by a pandemic such as this, because at some point the economy is going to turn. And if your credit is negatively impacted, when the economy turns, you're not be able to take advantage of some of the opportunities that will present themselves. Thanks, Jerome. Awesome clarification. And again, guys, we're loving the engagement in the comments. Special shout out and welcome to Trevor YouTube, your first time on the live. Love it, love it. Welcome. We're happy to have you. And yes, Dina, bringing the energy. Love it. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for joining. So still with you, Jerome. So pre-approval now, right? What is pre-approval? Because we talk about, okay, before you start going and shopping around, probably before you even call Howard now to help you look out for that property, perhaps, and how old would you say eventually. How do I get pre-approved for a mortgage, Jerome, and how long does the process take? What does it involve? Help us out. All right, so a, a pre-approved helps everyone. Um, it helps the realtor. It helps you. It helps you to, to narrow your search. So it's it's very important that you have a conversation with your bank to find out one how much you're qualified for and when you know how much you're qualified for you're able to narrow your search you're able to determine do i do i look for a property in a particular area because my budget is in a particular area so am i looking uptown versus versus mid-level versus rural versus do i want a house do i want a townhouse do i want an apartment do i want to land and build so it, it 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 helps you to narrow your search and to focus your 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 search as to what you want to do. So in terms of the process of getting pre-approved, um, the bank just needs to know your income. So we would ask for proof of income, which would generally be your last three salary slips. If you are a salaried person, if you are a self-employed person, we would ask you for your last twelve months bank statement. Um, may or may not ask you for financial statements, depending on how larger companies are all um, organized the governance structure of your company so we may ask you for financial statements but we generally want to see proof of income it's also very important to get proof of age because a mortgage is generally given based on age the younger you are the longer you get to repay the older you are it's a shorter the repayment time so very very important proof of age and proof of income and we also would want to pull your credit report to understand what sort of debts you have um it's very important to disclose all the debts you have so that you can you can get a true financial picture of the situation so we can we can give you a true identification of what you qualify for so proof of income proof of age and identifying all your liabilities thanks so much jerome two quick questions how do you assess folks coming over from overseas because i know we have a lot of folks viewing the live and the replay and they're based overseas and they love to get a mortgage in Jamaica to buy property in Jamaica? Is that something that mortgage institutions generally provide for? Or if they do, what do they use to assess? Do they use their credit score from overseas? Can you say real quick? Yeah. Um, not every institution in Jamaica um, do mortgages for non-residents. We do here at JMMB. Um, it's based on the risk appetite of the company. Um, so what we generally ask for is your last two years tax returns and a overseas credit report. Uh, as along with your bank statement so what the, the, the especially in america and and, and canada and, and and those first world countries where they have a robust credit bureau system it generally picks up all your credit they use your social security and pick up almost every um credit facility that you have so what we ask you to do is to provide one of the major credit reports so whether it is an equifax report whether it's a transunion or 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 you know credit karma that shows all the major credit reports and also your last two years tax returns um, can be able to, we can be able to pre-qualify you. But yes, we do offer mortgages to non-residents. Thanks, Jerome. And Godfrey from Facebook holding us accountable. I'm sorry, Jerome, did you indicate how long the pre-approval process would typically take? Oh, generally, generally, once all information is provided, you should be able to be pre-approved same time. 
So it it once you've provided your banker with all the information, your proof of income, your proof of age, and they pull the credit report in front of you, you should be able to be pre-approved same time. A general pre-approval lasts for about three months because things change. So it's very important that when you get a pre-approval letter, you act quickly because the pre-approval ends in three months because as things change rapidly we live in a very dynamic environment so things change rapidly all right awesome awesome thanks so much jerome great nuggets already guys i hope you're taking your notes and taking it all in um just going along quickly jerome um so from what so we've got my pre-approval letter in hand just about a couple of other clarifying questions though what's the maximum financing usually offered by mortgage institutions like banks so like can i get a hundred percent financing is there such a thing mortgage institutions have become a lot more creative um i, I always tell people that no is the best time in jamaica's history to own a home because the the customers generally the clients have a lot of power right now so mortgage institutions are are clamoring over 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 the customers who are who are qualified enough and, and can afford to borrow so we have mortgage institution that goes up as much as 97 percent financing of the sale price or the market value whichever is lower so but you can also access unsecured loans to find the balance so back in the day persons used to the hardest part of home ownership generally was finding the deposit on a house no, if you qualify for the for the deposit unsecured, you are able to borrow the deposit. So we have mortgage institution advertising that they will give as much as one hundred and ten percent of the sale price um, for a mortgage. So it's 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 much easier now. So mortgage institutions generally go up. The most I've heard is ninety seven percent financing, and you can access that additional three percent on an unsecured. Loan. So generally, you can up, get up to 100% financing for the purchase of a house right now. All right. Good to know. Good to know. Um, I just wanted to highlight a question here from Sharon, Sharon Anderson, coming in from YouTube. And, you know, this is a point that I think a lot of people would have raised even on Tuesday because in the time of COVID, a lot of financial institutions who also provide mortgages they would have been offering these debt relief programs and mortgage morator um, debt moratoriums and deferrals during the COVID time, you know, to help people out. Some people, again, were unfortunately negatively impacted financially by the crisis. Those, if, if, so if I took up one of those deferrals and moratoriums, you would say that I would, I, I would have had a negative impact on my credit report as a result, Jerome? Is that something we know just yet? Because I know it's early. No, if, 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 it, if it was processed correctly and if you were given a moratorium and you did not neglect your payment, it would not affect your credit. So if you had an approved moratorium, then your credit wouldn't be affected. But if you just did not pay a loan for three months, then, of course, your credit will be affected. So, uh, you know, a moratorium would not negatively impact you. Okay. Thank you so much for that clarification, Jerome, because I know a lot of people would have had that question and concern. Okay, so Jerome has done some great level setting for us. Let's switch over to Howard. Hey, Howard. Yes, Gary. Uh, thanks so much again for joining us. So Howard is our realtor tonight, guys. And we know, Howard, that, you know, buying or even selling, for those of us in this on the se selling side of the, of the property divide, is not, is not easy for a lot of people, right? can be seen as a very, very complicated process. And of course, it's one of the biggest financial decisions that somebody's going to make because, again, of the sheer amount of money involved. Now, of course, you're in the real, 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 uh, real estate business. <laughs> what is important? So I'm going to look for a realtor to help me to make this decision, right, or to find the right property for me or to help me sell the property. You know, could you tell us why is it important to get a trusted realtor? Well, Kerry, the key word that you just mentioned is the word trusted, right? Because there are many realtors out there and you have to find someone who you feel comfortable with, someone who aligns with your goals. So you may have, I, I usually align it to a scenario where you have a pool of friends, but only a few are in your trusted circle or your inner circle. And these are the persons who may understand you the best. You know, they are very honest with you. 
Um, they have your best interests at heart. That may sound familiar to you guys. And always have a balanced and transparent advice to give to you. So in real estate, um, and as you mentioned, it is the largest investment that one may make and sometimes can be very intimidating. Um, you would want a realtor that possesses the same characteristics of those persons that are in your inner circle. So having a trusted, not just a realtor, having a trusted realtor is very, very important because you need to have someone who's looking out for you. Thanks so much for that clarification, Howard. And a quick, you know, sidebar question, and folks may have this, it, it kind of came up on Tuesday in a, from a different angle, was yeah. that, is there anywhere I can go like a directory to see who are the reputable realtors or the ones that are just kind of running a little thing? You know, All right, well, is there a, you know, a place where we know we can, okay, these realtors are solid? Well, it would be remiss of me if I was if I didn't clarify the term realtor, because having a real estate license issued by the real estate board makes you a real estate agent, and you you now have a license. You are able to sell and 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 help persons with their real estate needs, and the act, the real estate dealers and developers, I consider those persons as salesmen. But when you join a professional organization and the term realtor is a trademark unique to the National Association of Realtors um, based in the United States, but they have the trademark registered worldwide. And the Realtors Association of Jamaica, we are that affiliate of the National Association of Realtors. So once you join our association, you now become the professional in the industry and you're able to take on to yourself the term realtor or realtor associate. So when you see persons around with the trademark R on their chest, you know that they are members of the Realtors Association of Jamaica. And they can and they have to abide by a stricter code of ethics. Um, so to answer your question more pointedly, if you would like to see where you can find a member of the Realtors Association, you just need to visit their website, um, realtorsjamaica.com or .org, and you will be able to search for a realtor and they stem amongst most most um, most agencies that you are you are seeing around. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> that was an awesome clarification. I was going to yeah. say, um, Howard, I was very excited because you know I I didn't know that <laughs> you know real estate agent realtor. I really didn't know that. So thank you so Correct. much for You're that. More than welcome. And I I know it benefited a lot of people um, in the discussion. Um, just to highlight, Michelle. Hey, Michelle, one of our one of Jerome's colleagues at JMB Bank. Michelle, one of our branch managers, is highlighting um, someone who had a question. She was just giving a clarifying point. You can get um, free credit report annually by visiting um, the one of our bureaus. You know, so in case anybody wants to know how to get that for themselves. Thanks, Howard. So we'll just jump back um, to Howard and to continue the questions here. Howard, how much? Uh, because we know your services aren't for free, right? Everybody are making our money, right? Realtors are, that's their job. That's how they earn. Um, what, what kind of pricing or how much does it cost for me to use the services of a realtor? You know, how much must I be setting aside? Well, to answer that fully, um, one has to appreciate that realtors can represent both sides of a transaction, which is they can represent the buyer or they can represent the seller. In many instances, we represent both in a transaction. But in Jamaica and for most transactions here, commission is usually paid by the seller. Therefore, their fiduciary responsibility should be to that said seller. And as much um, as it relates to, to the budget for a seller, this is something that is negotiated between yourself as the realtor and the seller. There's no set rate in Jamaica. We would go against the, um, the, 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 the laws in Jamaica if we were to set rates. So you can see rates for sellers ranging from five, you know, five, six, eight percent. If someone is giving you more than one property, you may even see a negotiated rate down to three percent. So it's not something that is standardized in the industry. This is always a negotiated position when you are representing the seller. And on the other side of the coin, if you are working with buyers, um, that are looking for their dream home or investment, um, they're going to call the realtors as well. And this service in Jamaica is usually free because, as I mentioned, the sellers usually pay the commission. So when the buyers call the realtor, don't feel intimidated. Don't feel that you're now starting to spend money before you move into your own home because we are paid usually by the seller. And so the services of finding that dream property is you is free. But it doesn't discount the fact that there are instances where you may have an investor or someone who say, look here, Howard, I want you to find a property for me. You are my boots on the ground. And I will pay you a commission 
if you find me that property. I'm not in Jamaica and I needed to do all the running up and down and I will pay you. And in cases like that, you cannot get two commissions. You can't get a commission from the seller, as I mentioned, and then one from the buyer. That's, you know, that that's not, not the right ethical thing to do. And so those scenarios do do um, do pop up. It's not often that it happens, but it is a possibility. So you may have buyer representation and you also may have seller representation. So budgeting for that as a buyer, usually you don't put that on your head and worry about that as part of your closing costs or opening costs. Um, that's something that we do for free because what we're doing as agents and brokers are bringing parties together. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm having internet issues. So oh, that no. hazards of doing a live in different locations in particular. I'm so sorry, guys. Thanks for your patience. I was having internet issues, so I totally got kicked off and, and had to reconnect. I'm sorry, Howard. Where did you drop off um, or the point where I dropped off anyway? What was your last point that you're wrapping up? Just how you wrapped well, up so we can continue. My apologies. No, well, that's quite okay. I was just in indicating that as realtors, we, we, represent, we can represent both sides of the coin. For buyers, it's usually free. Um, for sellers, there's a commission that is always negotiated between the realtor and the, the, the seller. Um, but there are instances where the realtor can, in fact, um, represent a buyer exclusively, and the buyer is going to pay that realtor a commission because he's you now the boots on the ground. And he will say, you can't, you know, I want you to look out for my best interest, get the best price for me, you know, determine if this is a good investment for me. And therefore you will not get two sides of the coin. You won't get the buyer side or the seller side. It's not very often that you see that in Jamaica, um, but it is possible where you can represent either the buyer or the seller. But in oh. most cases, we are bringing the parties together as we're called agents and brokers. We're big, bringing people to the, to the table. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I, I know this next question is probably going to be um, kind of weird question to ask the, part, the realtor himself. But suppose I wanted to buy a property without a realtor. Can I do that? Is, that? is that an option for me to consider? Yeah, the short answer to that is yes, um, for sure. You can do most things. I mean, if you, if you have a, a, a deep cut on your wound, uh, on your leg, yes, you can definitely try to do that. But I would encourage you to seek a, a professional um, so it's not good to embark on a venture just because it is something that seems easy to do uh, without having the experience so you may not have the expertise and the training as a realtor and it could cost you thousands and in, in some instances millions of dollars for just not getting the right professionals and trying to do it on your own so yes you can do it on your own so you have some investors that they're seasoned at this thing but at all times, I recommend that you engage professionals in all aspects of the transaction. So you may, you have to call on the realtor, as was mentioned in, in part one, call on the, the engineers, call on the valuers, because you may have an idea, but you may just not know certain things and you, you want to cover that all the bases when purchasing. So yeah, try to do it on your own, but it's not recommended. Thank you so much for that, Howard. And I'm yeah, I mean, we take that point that, again, given that this is probably one of the biggest financial decisions you'll ever make in life uh, and the size of the transaction. Again, we spoke on Tuesday about all the things that could go wrong. Uh, mm. You want to make sure, as you said, Howard, to partner with all of the professionals, the licensed and certified professionals every step of the way uh, to make sure that your interest is protected you know so we yeah. we totally are aligned and agreed on that point thanks guys loving the en engagement in the discussion in the comments so again continue to drop us your questions guys if you ha continue if you have any additional questions feel free to share them i'm gonna jump back to jerome real quick because of course I, again in the part one of the discussion of course nht as a provider of mortgages to help persons acquire their homes is usually you know a very preferred channel to pursue and what we want to know jerome is suppose i'm applying for my mortgage through a gmb for instance you know or, or how do i access my nht benefit i guess that's the first question how do i access that benefit first and foremost and how do i access it through a mortgage provider like a gmb all right, so um, JMB is, is, is a part of the, the Joint Mortgage Finance Program where you are able to access your full NHT benefit from the mortgage institution without necessarily having to go to NHT and, and coming back 
to the bank. So once you have met all the requirements of NHT, you are able to access your full NHT benefit um, as part of the joint mortgage financing program. So it's as if you went directly to NHT. So you get the same interest rate you'd have gotten at NHT. You got the same allocation. You get the same term is as in the length of term that you would get as if you went to NHT. So you wouldn't have lost anything by not going directly to NHT. So you can have that bit that 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 um that benefit of coming to JMB as a one-stop shop where you can access your NHT benefit and also get the balance to complete the transaction. Thank you so much for that clarification. And how do, do I need to be a contributor, right? Because there was a question about, you know, is it any and everybody that can access an NHT have to be a contributor, have to be employed, or, you know, just to clarify that as well. A contract you don't necessarily, worker? You don't necessarily have to be employed. Um, what you have to do is you one you have to be a Jamaican you have to be at least you have to be a resident of Jamaica, and you also have to prove NHT contribution. Um, me, most times they ask for contribution up to seven years, but you just have to prove your NHT contribution. So persons who are self-employed, you prove your filing. You once you've once you've been been approved by the NHT compliance unit, that they have verified that all your contributions are up to date. Because even, even non-residents can also contribute to NHT just to ensure that you never lose that benefit because it's a, it's a benefit to all Jamaicans. Um, really? So whether you live here or not? True, true. Whether you live, whether you live in Jamaica or not, um, you can access your NHT benefit if you live overseas once you are making your NHT contributions. Once you can prove that you've made all your NHT contributions. Thank you so much for that, Jerome. You know, a quick clarifying question here from Keisha on Facebook. Hi, Keisha, thanks for your question. For those people who would have spoke earlier about credit report and so on, um, and your ability to be able to apply for a mortgage. Suppose I lost my job during COVID, because some companies did that, they kind of did like a temporary layoff and I got rehired. Um, would that negatively impact how mortgage institutions assess me for a mortgage? You know that I'm back with the same company in the same job, you know, it's back to work and the company feels okay, we can bring everybody on back. Would that have impacted me any at all, you think? And I mean, again, guys, we're being very clear that every individual situation is different. But I know this is an issue with a lot of folks who would have been temporarily unemployed and know that it's reopening and back to work, you know, back in the swing of things. So... Again, I guess the concern is how would that neg impact them negatively or not their ability to be assessed for a mortgage? Yes, as you say, it, it, every, every, every client is different. Um, so we have to assess the situation. We have to look on, on the details of your employment. If you were rehired temporarily, if you've been rehired on a contract basis, I mean, a lot of companies have no laid off permanent staff and are taking back persons on contract. Um, so we have to look on the situation. So it's difficult for me to say yes or no at this time. It just depends on the situation. But if you're rehired um, in your exact role, you know, you're, you're, you've restored all your, your, your benefits, all your years of service has been restored, then I, I can't see any reason why you would not qualify for a mortgage. But if the terms and conditions have changed, then we have to revisit your, your, your current financial situation. Thank you so much for that, um, Jerome. And again, everybody's situation is different, so we can't take that and take it for gospel. <laughs> but at the end yeah. of the day, have the conversation with your banker, with your mortgage provider, and, and get the clarity you need for your particular unique situation. situation. Thank you so much for that, Jerome. Okay, let's hop, hop back over to Howard, our realtor. So, Howard. Um, so, okay, so I've decided to use a realtor, okay. And I'm looking to buy my home, second property, investment property, vacay home, whatever, right? Um, is it the realtor's responsibility now to find out about, you know, the sellers, why they're selling, da-da-da-da-da, realtors, and, and there's this myth whether or not, I don't know if it's a myth, but some people believe realtors may even know deals before they be, they're placed on the market. I mean... What's the role of a realtor? I mean, is, is, is that true? Is it that they're supposed to be doing all that research? Is it that they know about the deals? I mean, just break it down for us where the truth in that or not is concerned. Well, yes, um, the, the realtor may not always know the seller. 
because the way we operate in the industry now is that we collaborate a lot. So although we have different color schemes and different uniforms, we all try to work for the mutual benefit. And in Jamaica, we have a system which we call the multiple listing service. And all realtors, or most realtors, I should say, we would drop our inventory into systems such as these. So you may have a colleague of mine from a different agency that represents the, the, um, the seller and they know intimate um, things about the seller. But on the buyer side, we may not know all that information. What is important for realtors is for them to actually know about the property and to ensure that the property meets the objectives of what the buyer is trying to find out. As it relates to deals, yes, there are times when realtors will hear about deals that are upcoming, that have not hit the market as yet. You may be in conversation with a next door neighbor who is contemplating selling, or there may be someone who comes to you and you know they may put a scenario, so it's, you know, how much you think I can get from a house? And well, if you get that price, I think I might sell. And the realtor now goes through his diary and you know checks to see if someone can afford this $15 million or this $40 million property. And they will say, hey, this is not yet on the market, you know, but the person is motivated to sell. So if you think this property is worth your while, you can have a look at it. So realtors do have um, knowledge of, of properties that are not yet on the market. And, you know, sometimes you may see it on the market and the next day it's on the offer. So we will know of upcoming projects, even developments that are just approved and the, 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 the developers may be testing to see whether or not there are enough buyers. They'll contact the realtors, you know, I'm thinking of building a two bedroom um, or a couple two bedroom apartments in this area. If you know a person's coming along, you know, please introduce them to me and we will contact, you know, all our clients and say, hey, this is this project is coming on. So we do have firsthand knowledge in most of the instances and can share that with prospects. So we are there as your your, your, your boots on the ground, as I mentioned before, because we will go out there and hunt for your property. So if the property is not readily accessible in the multiple listing service, then we will have to start hunting. So we may drive from gate to gate or go in a community that you pinpointed to say, I'd love to live in this area. Um, you know, I, I sometimes and my colleagues will just drive into an area and not door to door. Are you interested in selling? We have um, ready buyers. Uh, I see one of my uh, my my, my colleagues from a different agency, they were advertising that we have qualified buyers. Um, I'm sure they came from JMB, but they're looking for properties in this community and that might jolt someone or motivate someone who may have been on the fence. So it is our duty to hunt out for the best possible properties for the consumers that we are serving and representing. Thanks so much for that um, clarification, Howard. So you, you guys also help to help support the buyer in the negotiation process, price negotiation yes. process for the property and getting the best deal? Yes, we, we our responsibility, um, although in most cases, as I mentioned before, we represent the, the, um, the seller and we have to look out for the seller's best interest. But a lot of times we are bringing the buyers to the table and we are there to even advise them. And I will say that it, you know it's not all the time that the buyers are comfortable with what we're telling them because they may think that it's commission driven. But because in a market such as this, we consider this a seller's market, you may not have the opportunity to say, let me try and say, oh, let me try and put in a little offer this and see if they will accept it. You may not have that luxury of time. So a realtor may convince you to say, hey, we need to go in at full price or we may even go a little bit above full price if this is a property that you really, really, really want. Um, but to be fair on the, on the other side, we can look at areas that may need improvement. So you may have a property that really needs some structural um, upgrades and uh, may have electrical problems. It may have plumbing issues. Um, here is where the realtor would advise you as to some of the the, 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 the mix and matches between your deposit and how much you're offering to see if you can get a good deal. Because when you acquire this home, the expense of renovating to make yourself comfortable will be exclusively yours. So before going in, you know, the seller may be thinking of what the house looks like when it is fixed up. He cannot necessarily ask that price because it is not in that condition. It's got to be a burden to the purchaser. So in that instance, a realtor will advise the purchaser to go in at a lower price to make room for for the work that is before him because you, what you don't want is to buy at market value and have to spend more money in your property to get that equity back in your property um will be you know it will take a longer time and you may overbuild in a particular area and spend more than the area 
can command at a later date. So we will be the ones that are best suited based on our expertise and the knowledge that we have of the industry to advise you as to what a certain um, price point, where a certain price point is for the different communities and trying to align with your um, with, with what you're trying to achieve out of a, of a purchase. Thank you so much, Howard. There's a great question here coming in from Dina or Dinah, forgive me guys, I don't know the pronunciations of your particular name, but Dinah, Dina coming in from YouTube. How can, how can they get access to foreclosures? Do realtors do that sort of thing? Um, if I wanted to buy a foreclosure, and again, I don't even know if that's a Jamaican term anymore, we again, we, we've seen all kinds of things coming in down through the television pipe, but you know, how, do, you, do you support buyers who want to buy foreclosed properties or that's out of the realm of a realtor per se? No, we do support them. Um, that's a, a, a viable option, especially for um, investors. So from time to time, banks such as JMB will have properties that are foreclosed or they will have what we call private treaties. And these are properties that are on the market that you really buy sight on scene or as is where it is. And this may be a suitable um, property in a nice development or it may need some work, but you're getting it at a discount because the bank is trying to recoup what is owed to them and trying to be as fair to the seller by going as close to market as possible. But these are deals because you really don't know the condition of inside. So you may you may be able to get access to these deals. And there are banks that will publish these things on their website. Um, even on our multiple listing service, the MLS that I mentioned earlier, there are banks and there are um, different entities or realtors that will list private treaties and foreclosures. So when we're looking for a two bedroom, two bathroom in a particular community, we will get those active listings from the owners and we will get private treaties and we will also get foreclosures available as well. So yes, realtors will have access to those deals as well. Thank you so much, Howard. And just to be clear, because you had, I think, you know, you made the point earlier about um, usually it's it's the, the the percentage type fee that the realtors get is more so from the seller side not the buyer side and i guess trevor here coming in from youtube um wondering perhaps does that mean that you're not in the, you're not going to operate in the best interest of the buyer and i think you you are at pains to clarify that that's not the case yes no that's not the case we are trying to get the best deals as as this, the name suggests agent and brokers we are brokering a deal we're trying to bring two parties with a particular objective together. And yes, our fiduciary is to the seller, but we're also trying to let the seller understand that this is the demand for his property and this is where the buyers are. So we are representing the buyers in their best interest, um, their best interest. But in Jamaica, like in other markets, we're now seeing where realtors are bringing the buyers to the table because our systems in Jamaica, having adopted the MLS now about 10 years old, we are able to represent buyers and some realtors are able to represent sellers. Some are very good at it because some realtors, they just want to know that you have a pre-qualification or a pre-approval letter from JMB and they will take it on and represent you accordingly. So yes, we, we are representing the buyers and then there are those who have the patience to work with sellers. Thanks for that clarification, Howard. Okay, great. So we're gonna jump back over to Jerome for a bit again. So Jerome, you know, there are a lot of people thinking about not necessarily buying a pre-existing home or, or building as it were to, to live in or to vacate in or to use as an investment property. Some people want to build, right? They'd rather take the land and build and go through. Yes, it can be stressful. And we heard about some instances in our part one discussion on Tuesday, but some people really honestly like to build. Uh, how does that work? Is there such a thing as a builder's mortgage, Jerome? How does that work? You know, break down all the deeds for us around what a, how builders can access financing to build. Well, as I say, Kerry, if you if you if you have the the strength and the and the and the expertise and the patience to build, then it is always an option that is available to you. A lot of persons want to get the exact. You know, they want to build a dream house. They want to be able to see, you know, I want my room like this. I want my room like that. I want my kitchen like this. I want my living room like that. So you get the specifics that you that you want when you build. So the, the, and and in most cases, it's cheaper to buy a, a a spot of land and build on it. In in a lot of cases, it's cheaper to do so, but it comes with a lot of. Of, of headaches and it comes with a lot of patience and it comes with a lot of micromanagement of a lot of contractors and skilled people so it's 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 
it's a recommended choice if you have the, the, the stomach for it, but it can be a stressful process. But yes, we do offer builders mortgages. Organizations do offer builders mortgages. Care a little bit more work. It, it has a little bit more control because we, we, we've seen a lot of persons start building and, and and we've seen a lot of unfinished building about the place because you know as as, as we build sometime inflation sometimes the cost exchange rate goes up and sometimes we're not able to complete the property sometimes we start and you know finish downstairs and not able to finish upstairs so it requires a little bit more management on behalf of the, of, of the banks and, and and the financial institutions but it, it it is definitely an option so in terms of the the, the process so what you'd need, you'd need if if you have bought the land before, then we'd need to see the drawings. So we need to see the approved drawings, um, what Jamaican people call blueprint, uh, to see what was actually approved by the parish council the, and, and and the drawings. We also need what is called a bill of quantities. A bill of quantities speaks to the construction, the cost of construction per square footage. Um, it shows the the entire. Um, building structure what's cost to build the entire structure we'll also in addition to the bill of quantities we need a contractor's estimate so the bill of quantities speaks to what it's going to cost you to build the contractor's estimate comes from the contractor who is, also, who is actually going to carry out the work um, that contractor needs to come with references of um of of, of, of work that he's done um construction that he's done and good qualifying references of people who can speak to the quality of his work and, and the integrity of the contractor. We, we, we also ask that you that you come with at least 20% um, injection in the, in, 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 in the construction. And so for argument's sake, if it is that the, the construction is gonna cost $10 million, we ask that you come with $2 million um, of your own money, because we want to know that you have a skin in the hat. We want to know that you have some level of equity in the, in, 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 in the property and that, and that the banks are not the only one putting up all the risk. So we ask you to come with that. We also want what is called a contingency because we know that properties, um, construction can go over budget. You know, you started with ceramic tile and all of a sudden you want to raise a tile. You, 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 you started with a particular um, finish and then you halfway into the construction, you realize that you wanted something else and you change the construction. So we ask that you have what is called contingency just in case the, the work goes over budget. Because a lot of time, that's what hurts construction. The 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 the, 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 the you know, miscellaneous costs, the overrun costs that we don't account for. So if we account for it from the beginning, it makes it a little bit easier. And what we do is that we manage the, the disbursement of the funds um, based on the project. So if, for argument's sake, you are approved for a $10 million construction, we ensure that you spend your portion of the equity first before we disburse funds to you. And we're dispersing funds in tranches. So we would probably give you the first, you know, $4 million for you to, you know, do the construction of the, the, the ground floor or whatever it is. And then you bring back the receipts from those to show us that you have actually spent this money. We come, we do an inspection to ensure that the work that you said you did was actually done before we advance further funds to you. For that construction so it, it, it takes a little bit more work from a mortgage standpoint but at the end of the day if it is that you have the strength for it and you have the the ability to micromanage the project it can be rewarding so yes we do offer it thank you so much for that jerome and and as you say you know just to just to underscore the point that the decision to build versus buy you know and buying could be an older property or newer property again it's 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 a decision you really have to make on your own, recognizing that each comes with its pros and cons, but certainly building, as you say, it can be very stressful. You know, on Tuesday, for those of you who didn't catch Tuesday's discussion, because I see a question here coming in from um, Low, Low coming in to us from YouTube about whether is it recommended that we buy the land and build or not. On Tuesday, we were talking about, again, all the stresses involved, you know, the, the, the workmen you have to pay every week and all of these sorts of things. It's really a very personal decision. But the good thing to know is that there is a process for those who choose to build in terms of accessing mortgage financing. Um, quick, quick question, um, Jerome, and um, I'm trying to see who asked it here. I think it's Eliza from YouTube, um, a few questions back where she was asking, is there a right age? 
that I should be approaching an institution to take out a mortgage? I mean, is there such a thing as being too old for a mortgage? Um, as, 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 as I mentioned earlier in the piece, a mortgage is basically given based on, the term of the mortgage is given based on your age. So the younger you are, the longer the term you get to repay the mortgage. Uh, so if somebody, the, 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 the longest term we have on, on, on in the industry right now is 40 years. NHT will go up to 40 years um, for repayment. And your oldest age should be 70. So they will go up to age 70. Most banks go up to age 65, which is your retirement age. So somebody who is 30 years old would be able to access their entire 40 years from NHT and their entire 35 years from a major billing society or commercial bank. So if you're under 30, it would be the best time. If you're over 30, you need to start doing something quicker, sooner than later. So, I mean, 30 is the, is the, is, 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 is the what I call a sweet spot. All right. Thank you so much for that, Jerome. Okay, so we're going to hop back over to Howard, our realtor in the house. And um, on Tuesday, again, in part one of the discussion, location, location, location came up as a key part of the discussion because, of course, everybody wants to make sure they're buying in the right location because there were points made about if you want to set, resell or sell the property in the future, where you would have bought the property is going to impact your ability to sell it at all, if not sell it for how much. Uh, so location, of course, is important for a number of different reasons. Howard, could you just break it down and tell us why is location important and what are some of the factors I, as a buyer, need to consider when looking for a location to buy a home? Well, location is very personal. Um, and it, when you consider home, that's somewhere that you want to go and feel comfortable. And home is very important because that's where we raise our families. That's where we get a peace of mind safety uh, that's where we find you know we, we come home and we feel safe our families are safe and again as you mentioned and we discussed in part one uh, what would always want to know that if that time comes and they need to sell that they will they, their property will be saleable or it would appreciate in value so yes i on the latter point the first thing about location is that you want to know that your house is easy to sell when that time comes um will it sell fast uh, will it be on the market for too long is this an area that is in high demand or is it somewhere that people neglect so the factor will be will vary based on the objectives of the buyer um, some factors may include access to essentials of life some people would want to be near banks supermarkets healthcare facilities work gym school churches you know even access to uh, the near nearest high highway so persons would want locations in that, that, that sphere. And this is applicable to those wanting to be in major cities like the corporate area. But there are others who would want to be as far away from the city as possible. Uh, so their location, location, location would be, may consider um, places that have easy access to entertainment and recreation. They may want to be close to the beach. They may want mountain views, they're right. So they want that tranquil, um, experience they may want docking facilities like jerome you may want to park his yacht, yacht or dock his yacht somewhere there along the lines and some person may want an acreage for farming or major entertainment so the location location is really something very personal but common to all groups would be the safety and good infrastructure um access to roads good roads lights water cable and in the new norm, even sanitation stations, right? But investors may be looking for properties that will attract international visitors, places that will allow pets, uh, prominent subdivision, some of the notable names, both in the corporate areas and out of town. And, um, you know, even in some cases, persons are going to wonder whether or not the community or this location will, you know, will allow for short term rental, which is a hot topic in these days. So, yes, so location, location, location is always something that is personal um, i know some persons have a pet peeve for traffic and with that we we we, we want to make sure that you know you the, the, the route the realtor has the, the duty to ensure that the route from home to school or to work is traffic free if that is a pet peeve of your purchase so location location is something that is dictated by the buyer based on their personal preferences
Sorry, guys. I always do that. Mute myself, forget to unmute, and then finding the cursor. <laughs> Thanks so much for that clarification, Howard. Um, a quick question, a little bit of a sidebar question, but I'm sure you would have encountered this in your experience. I see a question coming in here, a few questions back from Rikisha. Rikisha uh, coming in to us from YouTube. Hi, Rikisha. Um, I, it's a sidebar question, Howard. If, if I'm buying a property and there are some tenants in there, you know, whose responsibility is it to get the tenants to vacate? Is it me, the buyer, or the seller, in your experience? Where yeah, you've you, seen yeah you, usually the, uh, it is a seller's responsibility, and it's dictated by the, the offer that you make against this house. And the offer, the term, the, 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 the possession would be, I want vacant possession. So it, once you can allow me to move in right away, I'll buy this house for you. I don't want to have the hassle of getting your tenants out. So oftentimes the offers are asking for the, the seller to have the persons vacated. Um, there are instances where you want to keep the tenants because they're good tenants, they're paying the tenants on time. So those are um, things that you would look at. But I must make a point that for private treaties and foreclosures, um, as I mentioned before, and Jerome could back me on this, um, though, that is sight unseen. And they, whereas you're getting a good deal, the onus is now on you to get the, the occupant out of the home because there may be owners that are reluctant to leave. There may be squatters on the property. I'm giving you this deal and it's a price break. Um, if you want to take the hassle of getting them out, that's on you. So therefore, um, the, in cases like that, sight unseen, as is where it is, it will be the purchaser's responsibility. But typically in, in a straight up transaction, the sellers are responsible for getting the, the tenants out. Great, great question, and thanks for that response, um, Howard. Um, just a question here coming in from Lo, Lo again um, from YouTube. Howard, is there a secret sauce to finding affordable real estate in Jamaica? So does such a thing exist? You know, I think it's a great question. You know, hey, I just say sauce. Um, <laughs> I would, if you want, if you want to consider your realtor a sauce, then then certainly, because the secret is really working closely with your trusted realtor. Um, they, they will have the, 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 the first-hand knowledge of what is coming, what is on the market, where is the hot spots. Um, so the secret is really working with a realtor that is in the know. Um, I think earlier I saw some comments mentioned about the, the more experience your realtor has, is the, the, the better they are able to serve you. And that is exactly true because the, your realtor with the experience will be able to determine, the, to determine what the market conditions are like now and whether or not affordable, which is subjective, is affordable in this day and time. And if it's something to, to, to go after. So I think the, the, the secret sauce or secret gravy, that nice gravy that we we'll put on our rice is the realtor, if I may so, say so myself. Thank you so much, Howard. And I one final question here, here from Gamila. Hi, Gamila, from Facebook, before we flip back over to Jerome. Um, and again, in those transactions, I guess, where there you purchase a property and there are some, I guess, outstanding utility bills from the previous occupants that you're mm -hmm. greeted with. Um, how do you treat with that? Any, any, any um, feedback to give us there, Howard, based on your experience? Feel free to say no, but, you know. Yeah. No, no, that's an awesome. That's an awesome. That's that's an awesome and pertinent uh, question. And this is where you would not want to do a transaction without an attorney because your attorney looking out for your best interest would ensure that you are not buying and accepting liabilities that should have been settled. So all the water charges, you should get a letter of compliance from the NWC. That's where you're getting your water supply, the JPS, your cable company. You want to make sure that all those bills are settled, including property taxes and no transfer should be effective until all of those things are settled and you're taking up this property with a zero balance. And I must hasten to say as a property manager as well that buying into a strata corporation, ensure that you get a statement stating that um, the owner that is selling this property, they have settled all their maintenance charges or whatever charges that are levied on their account, because if not, you, it's going to be very difficult to add you to that new account um, with outstanding liabilities unless you are prepared to take up that liability and have it settled. But the Commissioner of Strata Corporation encourages everyone 
to even contact them to get us a, a certificate of compliance. But the property managers or the executive committee of these apartment complexes, they can issue a letter to say apartment number one, they have no existing liability. Or they may say, hey, they owe us $200,000 and we're not prepared to hand over to a new owner until they settle all of these arrears. And that's where your, your professional will come in in the form of an attorney. So yes, that's a very good question. And you have to ensure that that is clear. If not, unfortunately, you're going to have to take on that responsibility if your if title is transferred in your name with existing liabilities. Thanks so much, Howard. This is great stuff. And you know, I'm seeing all the questions coming in from Facebook and from YouTube. This is awesome. Kim Jal, I'd love to answer your question. Hi, Kim. Um, and this is probably for Howard, I think, or I don't know if everyone wants to jump in. Um, when you see a listed property that says under contract or under offer, what does that mean? And why aren't they removed from the MLS system after the sale has been completed in a timely manner? I hope I'm interpreting the question correctly. Yes, I, that's, a, that's also a, a pertinent question. And on most websites that you go to, you'll see different statuses. You will see properties that are active, those that are on the offer, and those that are on the contract. And in some instances, those that are sold. On the offer, in the first instance, is an indication that someone has shown an interest. They have made an oral or written offer, and they would have passed that on to the seller who is now considering whether or not they're accepting or they're, they're going to proceed with this transaction. It is not yet a transaction because the offer is conditional. It is now subject to a sales agreement, which is something that is now going to be binding. And the sales agreement is, in fact, the contract. And under the MLS, you may submit an offer up until when that status changes to under contract because the owner getting two million dollars before he signs that sales agreement will probably opt for that two million dollars even though he considered an offer that was two million dollar less so we will indicate to the marketplace that a property is under offer but the property is not sold it's not gone until a contract is signed which is something that is binding and in jamaica you need both parties to sign the buyer and the seller and consideration is to be given which is which usually comes in the form of a, a deposit. That way now we change the status on the contract. It is not moved from the MLS because that contract can also fall, fall through. Offers can be just wasted. People make offers every day, but they, well, let me go and talk to Jerome now that you have accepted my offer and it may take a longer time because they hear that they have to get their credit report right. They have to sell their house first. So even though you made an offer, um, it's not a commitment that is binding both parties. But in some instances, an owner may suggest to, to them that, hey, I'm going to consider this offer seriously. I want to give this young couple all the opportunity there is. So I'm no longer accepting offers. So that's not a decision that the realtor makes, but that's a written instruction coming from the seller as to whether or not they will want to accept or look at more, more offers, even though they have accepted an offer. But that's the difference between on the offer and on the contract. Contract is binding, offer is not, and is subject to that sales agreement. Thank you so much, Howard. Okay, so let's jump back. Jerome, your time again now. So, you know, on Tuesday, we would have spoken about things like costs and fees and all these things. Because, you know, let's keep it real. It's not just about the money that you're spending to buy the property that you need to have ready to, to, to put out there once you're ready to make that acquisition. Could you share with us, Jerome, what are the kinds or the types of fees and costs that one should, you know, be budgeting for even as they prepare to acquire a home or property? Thank you. All right. So there are, there are several fees and charges that, that, um, that one should budget for. Firstly, uh, the professional fees, the, the attorney fees. One would also want to, to do a, a valuation report on, on, on the property that they are purchasing. Um, that fee sometimes can be negotiated. The valuation and the survey as ID report fees can be negotiated between both parties if we can we can split between the buyer and the seller. Um, but those are, are costs that you, 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 you should budget for um you know we already spoke about the, the the realtor if you're selling um the realtor fee we 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 you also need to budget for a, an attorney if 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 you if an attorney is going to prepare your sale agreement for you and act on your behalf um there are things 
outside of the scope of, of, of the transaction that an attorney may have to act on your behalf. If there is a caveat on the property, if there is a breach on the property that, that they have to remove. So those are those are costs that you may not have budgeted for. But after you do your, sur your, your, your survey as ID report and you realize that the property is in breach, an attorney has to correct the breach. So those are costs that you that you have to factor in as well. There are bank fees, um, processing fees that you should you should factor as well. Um, those fees can be can be can be um, negotiated. Um, some of those fees can also be covered by by NHT um, if 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 you if you so desire um, to up to a certain amount. There's also stamp duty and registration that you have to pay. Um, both on the the transfer side we, at, the, at the attorney and also on, on the bank side when you when you register in a mortgage there is a transfer tax that that your that the government has, has has been very generous in reducing in recent times um back in the day transfer tax was sometimes as much as five percent but it's now down to two percent so it's a lot more affordable now um so there is stamp duty there's registration fees um, that you have to factor in both on the again on the transfer side and the 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 bank side as well. So mainly the processing fees, the stamp due to the registration, and the 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 the, the professional fees, the attorney, the valuator, the survey as ID um, persons, and any miscellaneous costs that 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 can pop up within within the transaction. So I would say if you're purchasing a property, budget anywhere from from anywhere from 10 to 12% to, to of the sale price in terms of processing fees and taxes, right? Anywhere between 10 and 12%. Of course, and thanks Jerome for that. And of course, we recommend always shopping around um, from the various, uh, among the various institutions to make sure that you're getting the right uh, deal for you where, where, where fees and charges are concerned, where, where it's, that's possible. I just wanted to highlight a question here from Trisana. Trisana from YouTube. Insurance. I know we had touched on insurance in Tuesday's discussion, Jerome, with, with Stuart. Because we know, you know, insurance for life, for your life, and then insurance for the property. How does that all work? Is that part of the monthly payment? And yeah, you know, just break down the insurance part of the, of the additional monies discussion that we need to find. And get all right. So there, there, so there are two types of insurance that you that you factor, and in some cases there are three types of insurance. There is life insurance. So you 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 when whenever a mortgage is is being taken out on a property, we generally want your life to be insured. So the event of death or in the event of critical illness. The mortgage is settled. So a husband and a wife um, goes to 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 the bank to take a mortgage. We generally ask for life insurance over both life. In the event the husband dies, the the mortgage is, is settled. If the wife dies, the mortgage is settled as well. So you know it's generally recommended. It's prudent um, financial management to ensure that life insurance is a part of your estate planning. So um, we generally recommend and and um. And, and, and suggest that life insurance be, be a part of your mortgage. The second aspect of, of insurance is peril insurance. So you generally replace, um, insure for the full replacement cost. And there is a difference between replacement cost and market value. A property may be in Cherry Gardens, um, may be valued at 50 million, but the replacement costs may be 25 million. Um, the replacement cost seeks to indemnify you so we will restore the original position that you were in prior a market value takes into consideration other factors that replacement costs don't so a market value might take into consideration things like the the the, the community that you're you're living in the access to to facilities the access to urbanized areas and um but market but, but the, the, the replacement cost just looks at replacing and indemnifying you in the event of a total loss so a property, as I said, in, in Cherry Garden that may value 50 million with a replacement cost of 25 million. So we, we the insurance company will insure you for 25 million. So in the event of a peril, in the event of a total loss, the insurance company will pay you 25 million less your excess to indemnify you. They won't pay you based on the market value. So sometimes in the event of a total loss, you are left with you know 
a, a debt on your hands because the insurance company can't fully indemnify you for the full replacement the, the full replacement costs are the market value that you had spent on the property so that's life insurance and that's pearl insurance there's a third insurance in, in 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 some cases where you're buying into an apartment complex where there is a strata you we, we generally ask for evidence of strata insurance so once once there is communal living on their shared roof the, the entire complex has to be insured because um in an apartment complex you know my my roof can sometimes be somebody else's floors um we share walls you know i mean we share we share you know a common space so the entire complex has to be insured so generally banks ask for evidence of peril insurance of 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 of, of strata insurance and also life insurance so it's very very important that we understand the difference between life insurance peril insurance and strata insurance yeah. all right thank you so much for that clarification jerome and just to be clear the insurance premium claim payments will be a separate payment but a lot of the fees you would have spoken to like commitment fees and stuff that would be rolled up as part of the monthly mortgage payment or you need them up front when when do all of these monies fall due all right so different companies handle things differently so um life insurance gener life insurance should generally be a part of your monthly payment so most companies factor the, the the life insurance component as part of your monthly mortgage subscription the peril insurance is something that you 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 are responsible for every year uh, a lot of mortgage institutions what they'll do they'll divide the annual premium by 12 and ask you to contribute to that on a monthly basis so you if if the if the, if the cost for the insurance is is twelve thousand dollars per year they would divide that 12 by 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 12 and you pay a thousand dollars in your monthly mortgage payment towards the peril insurance annually because each year you have to present your the financial institution with evidence of up-to-date um insurance coverage so instead of finding that lump sum money to pay for the in insurance every year the institution asks you to divide it by 12 and save towards it on a monthly basis so that can also contribute to your monthly mortgage subscription in terms of in terms of the processing fees being rolled up into the mortgage there it, it's generally not your processing fees generally comes from pocket um institutions will lend you this money um towards if if, if you can't come out of pocket there are a lot of times when institutions will give you unsecured loans that will cover your processing fees but generally you want to reduce your borrowings as much as possible when you're taking a mortgage so it's generally best that this money comes from pocket um you you, you save towards this amount and you pay this from pocket nht though nht provides you with a a, a a buffer that can assist you with your processing fee so if you once you take your full benefit from nhg or your full allocation nhg gives you an additional five percent of that that will be able to cover some of your processing fees so if the full allocation now is 6.5 million nhg will lend you an additional five percent of 6.5 million which is about three hundred and twenty five thousand dollars that will help you towards your closing costs and your processing fees so um some of those processing fees can be covered from that money and you and it's spread over the life of the loan to repay so you get that additional three hundred and twenty five thousand, and you get up to 40 years to repay that so it is you know it it it, it, it generally, generally helps you when it comes on to your closing costs thank you so much jerome want to hop back over to howard now for a bit howard what is an agency disclosure mm -hmm. what's an agency disclosure what's the purpose of it and 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 when does it come into play exactly all right so earlier we were discussing realtors representing a buyer or a seller and in in those cases usually you will have a document especially in the north america you have agent see this buyer's disclosure and a seller's disclosure and that's really a document that is um the ter um, highlighting the terms and conditions that that will steal the deal i guess between the buyer and the seller and their respective agents so it's highlighting the things that the buyer is res responsible to do and what the realtor is supposed to do on behalf of that buyer it is highlighting what the seller needs to do and uh, as opposed to what the, the the agent will do for that seller these are terms and condition and as we were asked earlier will we represent the, the you know ignore the buyer 
and only deal solely with the seller. There are certain terms and conditions and certain duties that the realtor will have to carry out for whichever side that they're representing. So if it's a seller, uh, we will try to get the highest and best price. We try to get the, the, the most qualified person to purchase the property. Uh, we will market the property for them. We will vet the tenants if it's a landlord situation. There are things that we are going to be required to do so that there is no ambiguity um, down the road. So for instance, even the, the, the commission is clearly identified. You don't want to come at the end of the transaction and then the realtor sends you a, a commission for 4% or 5% and 6%. And you say, but you never do so much work. The buyer come in two weeks, but you didn't know what the buyer did. This is something that you all will see in that agency disclosure as to what are the terms and what would be the end game when the transaction is completed for the buyer i'm going to look out for the most economical property for you i'm going to find the property that best suits your 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 criteria and i'm going to only negotiate on your behalf and that's where you come in but as i said in jamaica typically the sellers are the ones that pay the commission so our duty is to the seller but because of our systems and earlier we mentioned the mls we are able to represent both parties even though the seller pays that commission because if I represent the seller and I get paid um, a a five percent commission for argument's sake, the agent that is representing the buyer, I will then pass on a percentage of my five percent to that agent that represented the buyer. But so they in essence got paid from the seller, but by way of me, the the listing agent. And they would have had a duty to try to negotiate with me the best rate for their buyers based on their buyer's disclosure and me the best rate and terms for my seller based on my seller's disclosure. Thanks so much for that, Howard. So next question, I'm still with Howard. So Howard, let's fast forward a little bit. So let's assume, okay, I've found the property that I want to get. I've submitted my offer through the realtor to the seller and the seller has accepted my offer. Yay! what's the next steps now you know is it this is when i pay the deposit money you know what documents are required what happens at that point once we've we've had an acceptance of the offer yeah so once you have gotten that acceptance of the offer your your next step is really to contact your attorney to indicate to him or her that you are expecting or they should expect a draft sales agreement that will come from the seller's attorney that attorney now will now take the opportunity to vet that sales agreement, ensure that what you agreed with the seller by way of the offer, everything is aligned in the contract and that nothing changed. You have to this the attorney will also ensure that the the, the terms and conditions are reasonable and not overbearing, um, such as time to complete and um, penalties if there's a breach. Um, so he's going to try to find the best median between yourself and the seller. And once he's comfortable with that, then your attorney will then call you and say, hey, you need to come in because I now have the final sales agreement and you need to come and sign. And when you come, you need to now make your deposit, which can either be a transfer or check, whichever one your attorney requests at that time. So once you're... Um, your, your offer is accepted, you should now inform your attorney as to the next steps. But I must let you know that you should have all your ducks in a row. You do, again, I, I kind of intimated earlier that you don't want to have an accepted offer. And then that is when you're going into NHT. That's when you're looking at your credit report. That's when you're calling Jerome or JNMB. That's when you're running around trying to do all these things because the time factor between an accepted offer and a signed sales agreement, which binds both parties, is very crucial. And sellers may not be very um, may not be patient enough to wait on you to do all of those things. So you should be fully prepared when your offer is accepted, or even before you present the offer, so that if you say yes, I'm taking it, possibly the next day, because some attorneys are t are putting out contracts within 24 hours. You should now be in a position to have your attorney and yourselves prepared to engage in that transaction. And that is the next step, going into the sales agreement. And that is usually you know, guided by the persons that are, that are in the conveyancing process. All right, all right. Our friend Satchmo from Facebook. Hey, Satchmo, what's happening? When we ask what comes next, he said that is when the headaches start. 
<laughs> oh yeah, you know, that's why they check all the deposit money. Ah, I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, it is what it is, right, guys? But you know, awesome, awesome um goal goal to be achieved. You know, we support everybody who takes that step. So great. All right, thanks, Howard. So let's hop back over to Jerome. So Jerome Howard would have kind of just shared with us what happens kind of immediately after we have an offer and acceptance of that offer. So Jerome and, you know, we paid the deposit. Ooh. Um, so what, at what point now then, Jerome, does the financial institution, the mortgage provider, come in to release the funds? How does that process work? Just walk it through for us real quick. So once you have, once you have been approved for your mortgage and, and you got the pre-approval, once we now have the the signed sale agreement, it's 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 gone to the tax the stamp office to be assessed and come back. Um, that process can be anywhere between yeah three weeks and six weeks. Uh, once we get back this this the, the, the stamp sale agreement, um, you know would have gotten a valuation report, a survey as ID report, evidence of up to date property taxes. I mean, all the required information to do an application. We, 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 there's a general five to seven working days turnaround time for an approval. Once we've gotten the approval, then the client would be invited in to sign what is called the offer letter or the commitment letter, where we present an offer to the client for financing. Um, once this, this, this offer is accepted and the client accepts the offer and meets the conditions of the loan, which are generally a repayment arrangement, uh, whether it is you know peril insurance or or whatever conditions that is that is stipulated in the offer letter, once those are met, then uh, and and the fees the re the, the relevant fees are paid, then what is called a letter of, of undertaking is issued. Once a letter of undertaking is issued to the attorney, the transfer is then executed, so the property is then moved from one name to another. Uh, once that is done, once we've gotten a title that is free and unencumbered. Um, in the name of our client, that's when we we disperse. So that process can be anywhere from, I would say, 30 days to sometime 120 days. So, so um, it's based on the negotiation, based on, on what happens at the stamp office, based on what happens with the client, how soon the client is able to pay the pressing fees, how soon the client can get back the information to us, how soon the attorneys get act. On, on these transactions. There are some things that can be done to speed up the process. I mean, you can pay for express services at the stamp office or at the land agency that will move you up from sometime two, three weeks to sometime a couple of days. Um, there is an additional amount that is paid to do that. So there are, there are things that you can do to chop the time, but the, a mortgage transaction generally lasts anywhere from 60, I would say to 120 days but we pay over the funds to the, to the client once the, once we have a free title that is that is in our client's name um and unencumbered thank you so much for that jerome all righty um Okay, I still think I'm having some internet issues because <laughs> uh, I'm getting some freezing here, but we're still going to press through. Um, thanks again very much for that response, Jerome. So know that, you know, so let's let's fast forward again. So we've had the disbursement and so the release of the, the funds by the financial institution. How are, what can I expect on closing day now? Where, you know, I guess now I, I get the keys, I guess. How, uh -huh. What can I expect? All right, well, in Jamaica, we don't have um, what you see on TV, as you mentioned before, as what is considered the closing day. Um, but there is a closing because there's a point when the transaction is completed. And that, on that day, your attorney will call and advise you that the transaction is now completed. And this will include, as Jerome mentioned, a title that has your name endorsed on it. Um, and you would be advised as to where and, and how and when you pick up your keys and all the relevant documents to take to the entities such as the National Water Commission, water runs with the land. So you'll now have to update the National Water Commission that you are now the new owner. So you'll take along a copy of your title and the official letter from the attorney to say that you're now the new owner. Likewise, for Jamaica Public Service, the JPS, you will inform them that you're now the new owner. So you'll get a meter in your name or the meter will be transferred into your name. And um, we mentioned a lot about strata er stratas earlier. You will now take a letter to the strata um, office, the property managers, or to the executive committee 
where a property manager does not exist to say, I am now the new owner and here's my letter and a copy of my title. And they would now do the transaction for you that is applicable. And once you are in receipt of these things, then you, the next steps are really simple. You then will call, you know, me or your agent at Howard John Surreal to Limited, along with Jerome from JMB, a shameless punk like um, I heard in part one, and start the process all over again because now you are addicted to the home buying properties. And like we did in part one, and now in part two, you have understand, uh, you know, understand the ins and outs. So the next step after closing day is to prepare for your next purchase. All right. Thank you so much, Howard. You know, a great way to kind of take us through what we had. <laughs> main flow of the discussion uh, we're just going to take two additional questions guys we know we got tons of questions as i say we're from facebook youtube and twitter so we won't be able to get to all the questions but of course you know where to find us and uh, feel free to dm us we recognize that everybody's unique situation is in fact that it's unique it can be very very different so we ask you to reach out there are just a couple of questions based you know what we're seeing in the flow of the discussion question here coming in from laurie on facebook um because we spoke about insurance earlier and i guess some people uh, have this question because if i have life insurance already why do i need do i need additional take out an additional policy for the lending institution i can't use that policy that i have already break it down for us jerome yeah you are able to as long as the policy qualifies there are some policies that that don't qualify but you the, the the coverage or the death benefit of the of the policy should exceed the mortgage amount so if you say for instance you're buying a 20 million dollar property and you have 10 million dollars in insurance you would need to increase the coverage on that policy to cover the life insurance insurance policy if the term of the insurance exceeds the mortgage then you would have to take out a, 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 a life insurance that that matches the term of the mortgage so if you're getting a 30-year mortgage then you need a 30-year term insurance so yes you are able to 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 assign an external policy there's there's a cost to assign it and there's a cost to stamp it but those costs are generally marginal in compare in comparison so yes you are able to the, the short answer to the question is yes you're able to Thanks so much, Jerome. And another question here from Caron coming in from YouTube. Hi, Caron. So you spoke about, you know, time factors as it pertains to, you know, how the process goes for property that I'm buying. But, you know, you have developments, new developments that you may buy into from now or may want to buy into from now. But of course, they're not going to complete complete construction of that new property. The developers may not complete construction probably for another year or so. What's the, how does that process look different for those kinds of transactions, Jerome? They are, they are a little different, but they are pretty much the same. Uh, what would, if, if we, we basically know what the property is, is, is being sold for, um, a valuator can give a professional estimate of what the property will be valued upon completion. Uh, so we generally use that information. We use the valuation upon completion and once the, the 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 developer is able to provide us with what we call a certificate of practical completion we generally disperse using the certificate of practical completion so um an a letter of undertaking can be issued on an incomplete structure because we, we trust the the developer and is generally based on the strength of the developer and, and the relationship the developer have with the banks um, but yes it can be the process is pretty much the same but the difference is that we would we would depend heavily on the certificate of practical completion and also the relationship with the dealer. Thanks so much, Jerome. And final question for Jerome before we wrap and then go to our final nugget, because I know that um, there's one key bit of advice that each of you would want to share as a key takeaway from this discussion that you'd like to leave with our viewers. Uh, but Jerome, how for contract workers, you know, I know this is a big thing. We have a lot of people who are contract workers, contract employees. How, if and how are they assessed differently when they apply for a mortgage? Can you advise us, please? Again, we, we, we spoke earlier about every situation being unique. Um, there is no broad brush approach to contract employees because every contract is different. Some contracts are longer than some, some contracts are shorter than some. 
Some contracts are for renewal clauses, some don't. Some contracts have, have more stability than others. Some contracts are renewed more often than others. So there is really no, no broad brush approach to contracts. So each contract is, 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 is stands on its own. So we look on things like um, what's the what's what's the what's the, the 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 performance of the contract? What 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 is the the, the skill set that the person is expected to perform? Can this can this person be 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 you know is this person marketable? Can this person um, find a job somewhere else if if this contract is terminated beforehand? So we look on different things when we're looking on on on, on persons who have contracts. So it's 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 difficult to say, but it's 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 generally done on a case by case basis. But one of the most important things we look for is 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 how renewable is the contract. Um, what's the likelihood of the person being retained? What's the likelihood of the person being offered a new contract? How many times the contract have been renewed in the past? And what's the likelihood of the contract being renewed? Is 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 the person doing something that is that is significant is the person offering tremendous value to the organization that the, the organization cannot um, survive without this person. Those are some of the things that we look for when we talk about contracts, but it's it, it's difficult to make a, a broad brush approach to, to, to persons with contracts. Thanks so much for that clarification. And again, Jerome, we recognize that everybody's situation is different. And so we encourage people to have conversations with the requisite experts. Howard, I just this final question before we go into our wrap. Um, from your perspective, and it's coming in from Lo on YouTube, you know, what are your thoughts? I mean, I'm not going to ask you to go into mortgage rates in the next three years, because quite frankly, I don't think anybody knows where mortgage rates are going to be in the next three years, especially coming off of the back of a pandemic. I mean, and we're still in the pandemic, to be quite frank, um, and our economy continues to reel from that uh, with all sorts of different predictions about where that will land ultimately. But just from the real estate um, perspective, uh, Howard, where do you kind of see things going between now and say the next three years, if or if that's too long, maybe the next year, um, you know, where properties are concerned, maybe pricing. I mean, how do you see it now and how do you see things evolving so over the next 12 months or so? All right, early in our conversation, we mentioned the effects of COVID and um, a lot of persons expected that the market would have taken a downturn. Um, we have not seen that in the industry for the most part. Yes, there have been persons who have been impacted because of loss of job and their transactions have been canceled, but we are seeing where sellers are still motivated to sell, buyers are still buying, um, developments are still being approved and being built. And if that trajectory continues, um, the next, um, Im the immediate future up to another three years, uh, we should see the, the market steadily increasing and getting back to normalcy, which was before COVID. Um, but things are steadily continuing now. Sales are happening. Rental properties are coming on the market. And as the economy continues to recover from the pandemic, um, you will see things still happening. And as you can recall recently, the government has a particular push for the construction industry. And they would want this industry to still strive, even though we're going through this, the new norm and the protocols. So buildings, as I mentioned, they're still being built and these units are still being sold out before completion. Um, new bills, new appro approvals, and not just the high-end properties, such as the $30 million, $40 million properties. You do have um, low-income homes or middle-income homes. I think just yesterday, the Prime Minister opened up with NHT uh, a mass project uh, in Innswood. I think it's Sun Sunshine Estates. Uh, so the, the, the NHT is still committed to building these projects to meet the housing demand because that will never stop. And as people get, you know, they're, they're restored in their jobs or they get new jobs, and as I mentioned, the economy picks up. We are going to continue to see the the the, the, uh, the market um, continuing to grow, and 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 the values continue to to hold and to improve as well. And this is not just a Kingston and St Andrew area; it's all across the island. And we are seeing that more properties are being identified. People are land banking now in preparation for the um, for the recovery and for the what is happening you now. So the next. The next couple of years, I, I'm still positive. I'm very optimistic and I'm very positive and, and about the, the the market. And I do see where the diaspora, you know, they're looking to 
invest back home because if something like this was to happen again some of them may be forced to come back home and they want to come back to their piece of the rock so we are seeing you know an uptick in the demand coming from the diaspora and developers are building certainly to meet that demand um in areas such as mandeville etc so we we are hopeful and we're positive that this will continue so we're not daunted by what is happening now and, and the evidence is there Thank you so much, Howard. Uh, great to end on a very um, positive note like that. You know, so I'm just going to wrap up with a quick housekeeping matter. First of all, guys, we want to thank all of our viewers for joining us here tonight. Unfortunately, we couldn't get through all of the questions. We love the questions. We tried to get through as many as we could. But even within the context of the discussion, we trust that you would have been able to get um, some clarity. And again, we want to highlight that everybody's situation is unique. Um, and in that uniqueness, obviously, is different, and we encourage you to reach out. You know how to reach out to JMB. We're on all the social media platforms. If you wish to have a specific conversation, we ask you to reach out to us directly. When Howard comes back, I'm going to also ask him to share how he can be contacted. But please reach out, have the conversation, uh, so that you can get started and get going on the path that is best for your unique situation. So that's certainly that from me. Of course, again, we thank you for joining us. There were some questions actually that were responded in Tuesday's live because of course this home acquisition discussion, this is part two that we're having tonight. Part one was on Tuesday last, but you can catch the replay on JMMB's social media platforms as soon as they're up uh, because at that in that discussion, we would have spoken to an attorney at law we were talking we were talking about the 10 things that they don't tell you about uh, buying a home or property so please have a look at that as well awesome nuggets because we see questions coming up about you know um should, you know buying into a new development versus an old property pitfalls things i need to consider things like questions i need to ask my realtor my mortgage institution it was all broken down uh, from an attorney at law perspective acting on your behalf i say think of it as two hours of free legal advice about the home buying process please check out that recording and again this live is being recorded as well so please feel free to look out for the recording of this live and if you found any of this information useful we encourage you to share it with friends and family we're going to be posting it starting tonight going into tomorrow on all of our social media platforms well on certainly on youtube facebook twitter and on instagram so you can catch the replay break out break out a bowl of popcorn so you can replay and rewind and check out anything that you would have missed some of us joined a little late there's lots of stuff we covered at the top and of course share this great information now we will be back again jmb go get alive we'll be back again next week tuesday which is our regular slot we're keeping our regular slot we won't be back next week tuesday guys sorry but we will be back next week tuesday where we're going to be covering a very interesting kind of topic because now it's summertime officially as of next week all schools would have been closed right uh for the for the summer break you know it's been a weird and wild wa ride of a school term that just ended wow can i hear the parents of the house uh, so next week we're going to be looking at fun ways to do summer on a budget and no we don't believe summer is cancelled obviously at jmmb you know we're standing for the greatness of all so we are encouraging people to stay safe we know all of the guidelines and the protocols that have been issued by the government and even within that context uh, we are going to be having an awesome guest where you're going to have to follow us on social media to see who she is but we're going to have an awesome guest who this is her business it's her job to support people and provide experiences for people who want to enjoy the best of what jamaica has to offer because a lot of staycationing is going to be going on this summer not a lot of international travel going to be happening necessarily that's all good we live in an awesome paradise that millions of people spend money on each year to come and see so we're going to be sharing with you how to do fun things this summer whether you have a family or not single couple anybody fun things to do on a budget this summer so join us it's really going to be a fun conversation and again if you don't catch us on the live tuesday 8 30 next week uh, on facebook youtube and twitter you can always catch the replay on our social media pages as well right so now back to our gentlemen we're going into a segment that we call our final nugget so of course gentlemen we would have been discussing a lot of awesome things about 
all the things we need to consider again tonight from the perspective of the realtor as well as a mortgage or lending institution of all the takeaways you know if we're going to go to bed tonight we're going to sleep on it and then we're waking up tomorrow morning could you tell us each of you i'm going to start with howard our external guest first <laughs> howard what do you think is the key takeaway when i wake up tomorrow morning and i have home acquisition on my mind what's the first thing that i need to be doing as your biggest takeaway from this discussion tonight that you want folks to sleep on and, and execute tomorrow well, your execution tomorrow will come in the format of you conducting what is called a, almost a job interview. You need to in, interview realtors to ensure that you can find that professional that will walk you through the home buying process from start to finish. Someone who you feel the vibes with, you, connect, you feel connected with, and you know that this person will look out for your best interest. Someone with experience, someone who will connect the dots for you, put you onto the right professionals, so when you wake up tomorrow, you should consider now making the calls to ensure that you find that trusted realtor that will look out for your best interest. Thanks so much, Howard. And, and, and unconnected to the question, but it's a question I said I would have asked you. How do we find you, Howard? Okay, um, Howard Johnson Realty Limited. We are located at unit number 15, Ligony Post Mall, just across from um, Sovereign Center. Um, you can visit our website, www.hjrealtors.com, or on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter using the handle at Realtors with an S. And you can call us at 876 620 1457. That's 876 620 1457. We look forward to serving you. And, um, and working closely with you and Jamin B to realize your home ownership goals. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Howard. And Jerome, okay. what's your final nugget from your perspective, be chair? My final nugget uh, would be, you know, when, when, when you're purchasing a home, you know, it's probably the most significant purchase that you'll ever make in your life. So do your research. Don't make it be a rush purchase. Do your research. Um, speak to professionals. Um, identify your budget and stick within your budget. So take your time. Do your research. Speak to professionals and stay within your budget. Thanks so much, Jerome. Love that. Love that. Thank you, gentlemen. Viewers, can we do our usual virtual round of applause for our awesome awesome guests here tonight they were fabulous i mean part one was awesome part two just as awesome you know jmmb we break it down and give you all the goods all the great details information and content to help you to realize your goals of home acquisition probably information you're not hearing from anywhere else we're happy to be able to bring that to you over the past um couple of days well thursday and then tuesday this week as we focused on the goal of home acquisition so we thank you so much guys gentlemen you have been awesome fabulous you see the viewers them beginning up already so <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your expertise and for just so willingly and openly sharing it with us please accept our very very best wishes for everything that is good great and awesome as we continue to navigate through covid and live with covid as the new terminology is and um yeah thanks again guys and thanks to our viewers who tune in each and every time if you're new if you're regular we love you just the same come back to us tuesday 8 30 youtube facebook twitter where we'll be talking about fun things to do on a budget this summer uh summer isn't canceled we're just going to do it a little differently so we're going to talk about that on tuesday supporting you with that and um, we're looking forward to seeing you catch this replay when it's posted on JMMB's social media channels. Again, I always like to big up my marketing team who is in the background and always supporting with these live discussions. Of course, we couldn't do what we do without you guys. So thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. And all the best. Take care. Nighty night. Bye.